Good morning, church. Welcome to Church Online. Let's worship together. Here in your light. Here in your light we find what makes us come alive, a sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill, surrender to your will, your glory on display. Your glory on display. Come on. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised. Your love. Your love, a force of grace, consuming every space. It's uncontainable. You're coming like a flood. Our hearts are filling up. All things are possible. All things are possible. Awesome in this place Jesus, you are awesome in this place Worthy to be praised Jesus, you are worthy to be praised You will be praised You will be praised Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. We lift the name of Jesus. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. We lift the name of Jesus. Oh. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Yes. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. Your praise, your praise goes on and on forevermore. We lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. Sing it again. Your praise goes on and on forevermore. We lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come is what we're living for. We lift the name of Jesus. We lift the name of Jesus. We lift the name of Jesus. You've overcome this world with love And made my fight your own I lift my eyes and throw fear aside And sing out into the night Come on, let's sing it out together Cause even when the world caves Even when the fight calls even when the war's waged 
I'll take heart Cause I know you are greater Forever you are Savior I will sing your praise With all that I have, with all that I am, Lord Come on I stare down the waves Cause you own the time I still my soul and know You wait for me on waters wild Where faith walks above the storm Come on! Even when the world caves Even when the fire calls Even when the wars wage I'll take heart Cause I know you are greater Forever you are Savior I will sing your praise With all I won't let the darkness beat me down I'll sing in the night my hope alive in you And I'll walk through the fire and not be burned I'll pray in the fight and watch it turn Jesus, today I give it all to you Sing it out, I won't I won't let the storm weather my heart I won't let the darkness beat me down I'll sing in the night my hope alive in you Be burned. I pray in the fire and watch it turn. Cause Jesus today I give it all to you. Oh. Even when the world caves, even when the fire calls, even when the world's wage, I'll take us. Cause I know you are greater. Forever you will say I will sing your Whatever you've been holding on to, whatever your heart has been latched on to, why don't you release it to the Lord right here, right now, right in this moment. God is the God of the possible. You are the God of the impossible. And you're working right now. Because you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good Yeah, you turn it for good Come on, declare this today Cause you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yeah, you turn it for good He takes it, oh yeah Cause you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good yeah, you turn it for good oh, You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good yeah. Oh, you're moving mountains right now You move You 
you turn it for good Yeah, you turn it for good Yes, you do, Lord You take what the enemy made for evil And you turn it for good Yeah, you turn it for Sing this out. There's a grace. Cause there's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There is another the fire oh, There is another in the fire Oh All my dead All my dead that were dead beneath the waters Hey I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Thank you Lord should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know, oh, I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters. Holding back the sea And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There is another in the fire Whoa. There is another in the fire There is another in the fire Whoa. There is another in the fire Whoa. I can see, I can see a light In the darkness, as the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us as a prison wall cave in and nothing stands between us nothing stands between us oh no there's nothing that stands between us oh god we are forgiven Cause there is no other name but the name that is Jesus Come on He who was and still is and will be through it all So come with me in the springs between And the things unseen And his reckoning I know I will never be alone And I know Yeah I know Yo 
Cause I know that's where you'll be I can see Cause I can see a light In the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar In the heavens As the space between winds thin I can feel the ground Shake beneath us As the prison walls cave in Cause nothing stands between us And nothing stands between us Another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle I know that's where you'll be Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing even when. Cause even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work.
Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. I uh, can't see you, but you can see me. But we're all together uh, online at CLC Online. So thank you for joining us this morning. One quick announcement, just uh, quickly to share with you. Um, we have had Christina Maxwell, uh, who's just graduated high school, just come on as a, a one-year intern uh, in our administration department here at CLC. So you might receive something from her. And just so, uh, you know, if there's any communication that comes uh, from Christina Maxwell, you'll know that, yeah, it's not just Christina sending people things, uh, you know, just randomly, but she's uh, started this week as, a, as an intern, one day a week uh, here helping us, and we're so delighted to have her with us, but she's gonna be a real blessing to us. So just thought we'd mention that to you, and uh, thank you for uh, being aware of that, and uh, like I say, if you receive something, you'll know where it's from us. Well, today I wanna to speak to you about four things that you need to know about fruitfulness. And I think, at least I hope, that we're all thinking about being fruitful, and we're all wanting to be fruitful. And, you know, as the people of God, we've, we've all likely had opportunity to not only uh, share God's love, but to share God's word with people. Jesus called that sowing seed or scattering seed. And uh, however, in, in doing this, uh, I don't know if it's occurred to you or you've wondered why some people hear the word of God, which we believe is powerful, and they respond and others hear the very same word. The very same word. They could be in the same church service or they could be sitting in the same group and they hear it and it does not become fruitful in their lives. Well, Jesus spoke a parable that addressed that very thing. And this parable, he said, was a key to understanding all parables about the kingdom. So it's kind of an important parable and I want to take a few minutes and walk through it with you this morning. So let's start in uh, Matthew chapter 13. And verse three to nine, if you're following on in your Bibles, or maybe you have a habit of reading another version, that's okay, as long as it's not a diversion. <sighs> okay. Uh, then he spoke many things in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some fee seed <laughs> fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear let him hear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God today. We thank you for the scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation, uh, through which we get instruction. But Jesus, we come to you as a person today, and we ask you that you'd breathe on our understanding, that you'd open our hearts. Uh, if there's something new that we need to see, or if there's just something we need to be reminded of today, we ask that you would do that by your spirit, and we're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, you know, after this parable, uh, you know, the disciples kind of questioned Jesus as to, you know, why do you always speak to people in parables? I mean, you know, why, why do you do this? Uh, in other words, Jesus, why don't you just speak plainly so that everyone can understand exactly what it is that you're saying? Um, you know, dumb it down, break it down for us. And this is actually a really important issue because Jesus' response to what they, they questioned was, was kind of probably less than satisfactory. However, there was no rebuttal ever recorded in Scripture. In other words, they didn't get into a debate about it. But the point is this, that if the Father is not revealing to you, then you're not going to get it. Jesus understood that there were certain people, and he, he alludes to this, I believe it's in John chapter six, uh, John's gospel chapter six, where he talks about you know, those that the Father gave him. Uh, they heard the word, and, and he was at a point where you know, he was saying things to them, and, and, and you know, having a Jewish audience, they were not getting it. They were not receiving what he said, but he was completely secure. He knew that as he spoke words that he said were spirit 
and life that those who the Father was speaking to, God was opening their hearts and the seed was going in. Well, the same is true today. I can teach you, I can open my mouth, but if the Spirit is not opening your ears to hear what God is saying, you're going to miss it. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get the full impact. We all need to be taught by Father. And, uh, you know, the, the Apostle John refers to this in, in his epistle where he says, you have, an, you have no need that man teaches you. You have an anointing that teaches you all things. So that doesn't mean that there aren't teachers in the body of Christ, but it means that those teachers must first be anointed by the Spirit. And then you must be anointed so that the Spirit is actually teaching you and causing you to see and hear what the Spirit is saying. So uh, I want to get into the meat of what I feel to bring to you today out of this passage. So the first passage we just read, Jesus gives the parable. And then in between, which I'm not going to today, there's a whole passage in between where Jesus says, hey, it's been given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's been given to you by the Father. And not everybody else is given. But he said, you know, there are prophets and 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 uh, holy men who, who desired to see what you see and to hear what you hear, but they did not. It, it wasn't in God's uh, agenda. It wasn't in God's time. It wasn't in his counsel at that time. But they, those apostles, those people sitting there, his disciples, hearing and seeing and witnessing Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, in flesh, speaking and performing miracles and, and ushering in the kingdom of God, they were a select group. And he said, there are many people who are going to hear, but they're not going to understand. They're going to see, but they're not going to perceive. And as we know, there was many people who argued with Jesus, who tried to refute Jesus. They were not receiving his ministry. They were not hearing the voice of the Father behind him. They did not understand that he was sent from heaven and that he was hearing. So he breaks down this parable for, for the sake of his disciples because his disciples were going to be sent out into the harvest. Just like we are sent out into the harvest. And, and so he said, this is, this is a parable that you need to understand because it's a key to everything else. And it, 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 it will help us understand. So picking up at Matthew 13, verse 18, this is what Jesus says. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. In other words, for you guys, I'm going to break it down. You need to understand he wasn't now in public. He was just with his disciples. And he said, okay, I'm going to break it down for you. But the other people, they're just going to hear the parable. And either the father is opening their heart to hear it, or they're not going to hear it. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, I'm sure we've all encountered that. Then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside, but he who received the seed on stony places this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while or a short time. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. In other words, it's neutralized. And he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces. I love that. Who hears indeed, who, who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Now, this parable is, as I've already said, it's a salient parable. It's, 
it <clears throat> in all that it, it unlocks the secrets of the kingdom of God, beginning with an understanding of how and why the word of the kingdom does and does not prosper and become fruitful. Does the word of God sown into hearts always produce the same kind of harvest and the same kind of results? We know it doesn't. Now, is that because somehow the word is deficient? You know, it, it works better in certain circumstances or, you know, in certain atmospheres. We have to create an atmosphere. We hear a lot about that. Uh, or, you know, it's deficient and powerless. Uh, some seed is better than other seeds, you know. Um, Book of James, don't preach that. Uh, you know, <laughs> don't tell people everything Jesus said. You know, uh, dumb down the gospel. Just give them the good parts. You know, that's, that's, that's not the key to effective preaching. You know, is, is one preacher better than another preacher? He's getting a lot of results because he's a better preacher. Well, Jesus, if, if you read the Gospels, Jesus never gave his students preaching lessons on how to be more effective in their communication. There's a lot of seminars. I've been to seminars, I admit it, um, that talk about how to become a more effective communicator. And because communication is a big part of what I do, it makes sense to try to learn how to be a better communicator. But you know what? Jesus never took the time to talk about that because Jesus understood and believed in two things. Number one, he believed in the veracity of the seed of the word of the kingdom. Number one, the veracity of the seed. He knew that the seed is always good. That when you're preaching and sharing with people the word of God, it's always good. The seed, there's not a problem with the seed. The seed is not the issue. It will bring forth. It has power in it. It has life in it. It is good. And then there's the soil. The second thing Jesus understood and believed was the soil condition upon which that seed is sown. And that is more the determining factor. It is, is that because uh, the word works in some circumstances. It works it's effective in, in the conditions, and we see that. So there's four kinds of response that Jesus really kind of boils it down to for his disciples. He says, there's, you, got, you got to understand this, guys. You're going to go out, you're going to sow seed. And in order to do that, you need to understand there's four kinds of response. It's important to note that Jesus didn't talk about percentages. And I, I heard a guy one time say, um, you know, he was a, he was a leader uh, of, of a movement, and he, and he shared, and he said, you know, Jesus said, well, there's only 25% of the seed that's going to bear fruit. Well, Jesus did not say 25%. And so we need to remove the percentage thing. He said there's four types of hearers. He didn't say only 25% of the people who hear the word are going are to bear fruit. So get, the, get rid of the percentage. It's got nothing to do with percentages but there are four different kinds of people. And so he said he gave them four kinds of responses that will occur when the word of God and the word of the gospel is disseminated. When the word of the kingdom is shared, whether it is uh, in a church setting, whether it's online, whether it's one-on-one uh, with, -on -one with a family member or a coworker, and I've done all of those. I have shared with family members. I've seen family members come to the Lord. I have seen... Um, Co-workers, you know, when I, when I, back in the day when I, you know, was just working jobs uh, at different places, I remember sharing the word of God with many co-workers and seeing some of them come to Christ. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an awesome thing. Other people I just encountered on the job and shared the word of God with them. And, um, and you know, really whether, whether they receive the word or not, is not the point is that we are to share the word regardless of their response. It's important that we as people take responsibility to share the good news. I think you'd agree with me there. And we all need to be encouraged to do that more and more. So I'm sure that we've seen how people respond differently. And because Jesus' disciples were called to go and do this very thing and to broadcast the seed and the good news throughout the world, it was important for them to understand what was going to happen. So number one, some of the word falls by the wayside. And Jesus described this as a place where the birds of the air, and those birds are symbols of the demonic powers. And it's, it's about people who hear, 
but they never understand at all. They're, uh, there's something lacking in their understanding and spiritual things, are, it's just like a mystery. It's a wall, they can't see through it. Uh, and uh, it, they're incapable of ingesting and processing the word of the kingdom. And so Satan comes and he steals that word. He snatches that word. And you can just see those birds coming down. They see the seed and you know, before it gets into the ground, they just snatch it right up. And that will happen. Jesus said, this will happen. Satan will come. And uh, those people, they just don't understand it. And the word is just taken immediately. They never get it. It never enters their heart, their spirit. It was not mixed with faith in order to produce a harvest in their life. And so Jesus concluded, no understanding is the issue there. No understanding. They don't get it. They just don't see it. I want you to notice that he never... Uh, He never gave instructions on how to rectify that. He didn't say, well, let me tell you another parable, and this is how you can fix that, so that all the conditions are good. It's just a reality of life, that the seed will go out, and some people just are not going to get it. So don't worry about that. It's not your job to make them get it. It's not your job to really be a persuade, you know, to, to fight with them and persuade with them, it's it's your job. Our job is to scatter it, sow it, share it, live it, be a light. But understand that there's some people who just will not understand. It. Number two, some falls on stony ground. In this case, there's not so much uh, soil, and it springs up quickly, and the sun rises and it withers. So the not very little soil. It it kind of takes root quickly but the sun rises and that thing withers, it dies. It doesn't take root uh, in the soil. Jesus explained that these people are people who hear the word with joy. So sometimes you really think, man, I got a, I got a live one. You know, I, I cast my line and got good bait and something bit and wow, it's lively. I think I got a good one here. And then only to find that it got off and something happened. They heard the word with joy. And I can tell you that I have seen people over the years who responded at first. It's like they responded with joy. But having no root in themselves, I've pondered much about that. Having no root in themselves, they only endure for a short time. Maybe you've known someone like that. Unfortunately, as I said, I've seen people over the years that if any trouble comes, if any tribulation or persecution because of the word, if there's any pressure on their lives, they stumble, they're unable to continue. You know, as as they're fine as long as everything is good. But you know, some people are not gonna be happy that you decide to follow Jesus. Some people are not gonna be happy that someone else decides to follow Jesus, that their wife decides to follow Jesus, or their husband decides to follow Jesus, or their son or their child. And I'll be really candid with you, when I first received Christ, my mom, um, and, I, and I, w- I had a background, I was in trouble. I was in trouble with the law, I was on drugs, I was messed up in a lot of ways. And I'll tell you something, um, my mother wasn't that excited about me becoming a Christian, because I was raised in a certain uh, denomination, and you know, being this born again stuff and reading the Bible, like, what's that all about? Um, you know, and she begged me to go back to my old church, and which which I did, uh, just because she was my mom. But I knew I couldn't fit there. I knew that it wasn't going to work. And so I, I kind of came home and said, hey, mom, I love you, but I got, you know, I got to follow what I feel God's calling in my heart, my spirit, and where there's life. And there's just, I don't get any life out of that. It just doesn't seem to be life-giving. And it wasn't life-giving. And so uh, the reality is that some people are not excited, even though Jesus changes your life. You know, you're not in trouble with the law. You're not doing drugs. <laughs> it's almost like you'd rather be back there. I mean, that wasn't true with my mom. But the point is, is that it's like people would would rather see anything else than you find Jesus. And so sometimes there's trouble, there's persecution. I had friends who just, 
man, they just dropped me. They, they just weren't, they, they stopped calling. They, they didn't want me hanging out with them. They made it kind of clear, you know, especially if I tried to share my faith with them. They said, hey, man, you know, I'm really glad that uh, you got this thing going, but I don't want to hear about it. And I don't want to talk about it. And I don't want, you know. And so I was marginalized. And maybe you've experienced that too. But, you know, part of that is the process of proving whether something has really taken place in your life. It did not stop me. I didn't like it, but I realized it had a purpose. And so some people with them, as soon as there's any trouble, any persecution, it, the word just shrivels up and dies. And uh, the enemy can stir his people up against you to, to slight you, to mock you, to exclude you, to marginalize you, uh, even if it comes to promotions on the job or opportunities. Um, I, I'll tell you this one story. I had a friend who, uh, I was on staff for uh, a time in a church in Ottawa. And there's a lot of government people, obviously, in Ottawa who work for, you know, the armed forces, who work for the RCMP, and all the headquarters are up there. And so there was this one guy in our church, and he was an RCMP officer, and he was from the West, but he was living in Ottawa, and as I understood, as he explained it to me, in the RCMP, you know, you, you have to get all different kinds of uh, exposure to different parts of the the uh, the Mounties in order to get promoted. You just can't be like in one thing all your life. So he'd been in a cruiser, and he'd done this and that and the other thing, and now he was in Ottawa. Uh, working whatever in the system there. And now they were sending him back to the West to be the chief recruiter. So he was going to be the top guy in the West recruiting new candidates. And so he told me before he left, he said, you know, he's waiting for a house to sell, but he was already kind of communicating through email. And he said, listen to this. He said, I got an email from the guy who is going to be right under me. And I said to him, look, have we, have we got any any recruits, have we got any new faces? And he said, yeah, I've got about a half a dozen here. I was gonna put the files on your desk so when you come. And he goes, well, just tell me about them right now. So I think it was a phone call. So he was talking about it. He said, well, there's this guy and da 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 and there's this woman and she's da 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 And then third one, he said, yeah, this guy, you know, uh, he looks really good, but he's, you know, he's, he's one of those born againers. We don't want those people around here, do we? That's what this guy said, who was going to be the, to the guy who was a Christian, who, who he didn't know he was a Christian, didn't know he was born again, didn't know he was spirit-filled, didn't know that his wife was on my worship team. And, uh, and so he said, excuse me? And he said, uh, yeah, well, I, you know, uh, he starts telling me, he said, you make sure that that file is on my desk. In fact, right now, give me his name. I want to write that down. And I want to interview that guy. You call him in and don't ever, ever tell me again that we're not, that we don't want people who are born again. And the guy just said, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> well, that guy became a pastor out in Alberta, uh, you know, the, the recruiter. But, um, you know, that guy was ready to be marginalized by someone who, who thought, man, we don't need, we don't need those people. Hear what I'm saying? Okay, number three. Some pe some seed fell by the thorns. And when, when the thorns sprang up, it choked the seed. Now, this is really important because I think, I think that this particular soil condition is probably more prevalent in our culture than maybe some of the others. It says, when the thorns sprang up, it choked the seed. And those who hear the word of God, but the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. Now, let's stop there and just think about that. Deceitfulness of riches. What is that all about? Have you ever stopped to consider how riches could actually deceive you? I mean, we have a lot of people who preach a gospel that says, hey, the more wealthy you are, the more godly you are. You know, we have we have some people who preach a gospel who's who basically means, you know, if you're really holy, you got lots of money. Um, you, you got 
some people who think that that's the end of your faith. You know, the end, if you're really faithful, uh, God's just going to bless you with all kinds of wealth and money. Well, guess what? That's not always true. In fact, if you look at the whole world and Christians all over the world, it's not really what the kingdom is all about. In fact, Jesus gives us warning and he talks about the deceitfulness of riches. And I would ask you, I need to ask myself too, because I live in this culture. And, you know, as I've been in the workforce 47 years, that's right, you heard me right. <laughs> I've been working for 47 years. Well, obviously, um, you you gain. You if, if you manage your money wisely and you do things wisely, you, you, will, you will gain and you will increase and you will have more. But, but God says that there's a, there's a subtle deceitfulness that can come with riches that can choke out the word and it can become unfruitful. And I think that's, it's one that in, Christians in our culture need to guard against. I think that there are a lot of thorns that the word could fall into in our area. Wherever prosperity and affluence is preeminent, this danger exists. And maybe you've never asked yourself that question. Has my wealth deceived me somehow? You know, the deceitfulness of riches, telling you that you can trust in them, telling you that, that you're safe. You know, I've got enough money now, I'm safe. I don't have to worry about nothing. <laughs> Well, there's a scripture in the Proverbs that says, uh, riches make wings and fly away. You know, w we didn't know a year ago that COVID-19 was going to happen. There are people who've lost their businesses, lost, lost their livelihood. And guess what? Uh, this may not any be anywhere near the end of what may happen to our culture. And uh, in some ways, you know, not that it's good that anybody dies from this, and I, I don't want to send that message at all, but maybe in some ways just the humbling of our culture and, and uh, you know, su suffering loss sometimes uh, causes us to have to look for other answers. And when you've got a culture who is just secure in, in all our stuff and all our affluence and all our prosperity, um, it's hard for the word of God, if you haven't noticed that, it's hard for the word of God to make an entrance and to be fruitful in lives that feel they're full of self-sufficiency and have lots of money and have lots of options and have lots of affluence. They don't need church. Thank you very much. Well, the signal that it is happening is a person becomes overwhelmed with cares, that they're preoccupied with all their stuff. They're thinking about this and they're worried about that and they're thinking about this and, and, and all their time and all their energy is, is caught up in their stuff. And so what's left over for God? What's left over for the work of the ministry? Did you know that you're called to the ministry? Maybe the ministry just goes by the side. Well, I, th I thought Pastor John and, and Pastor David and Everett and all those guys, they're called the ministry. I, you know, I do this. Well, that's right. You do do that. And, and perhaps what you do in one sense can be a ministry. But I guess what I'm saying is, is that Jesus is sounding out a warning and a signal that that's happening is that a person's life becomes overwhelmed, preoccupied with cares and riches so that the word is no longer the main thing that's moving and motivating them. I mean, doesn't it sound strange that Jesus is inferring that the living and powerful word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, can be overcome by things? As powerful as the word is, it can be overcome by things. Wealth, prosperity, affluence, and the cares that burden us as a result of having them. Unless we can navigate prosperity. Someone once said that prosperity is the greatest test. 
If you look back in the Old Testament and you see the warnings that, that are in the book of Deuteronomy, before the children of Israel entered the promised land, while they were just, they were ex-slaves, like you and I, <laughs> we're ex-slaves, we were s- s- slaves in the kingdom of darkness, slaves to our sin and slaves to Satan. And then we come out and we're in the wilderness for a little while, but God's fixing to take us into our promised land. And, and the warnings were that when you get to the promised land, don't forget the Lord your God. Don't forget to, you know, and, and all the things that they were not to forget because God knew that all of a sudden, you know, in the wilderness, nothing was competing for their attention. But when they came, when God brought them into blessing and increase and ownership of possessions and wealth, he said, now you've really got a guard. And of course, over generations, they failed the test. I trust that we won't fail that test. We have to navigate this. It's better for us to get rid of everything than to lose out on the kingdom of God. Jesus said, this is one place where the seed fails, is where you and I are overcome with cares. Deceitfulness of riches choke out our fruitfulness. Number four. Number four, you, you, can, you can breathe easier now, okay? Number four, and some fell on good ground. This yielded a crop some a hundredfold. Think about that, hundredfold. I mean, just everything in their life was just fruitful. Some 60-fold, some 30-fold. And in reality, you know, you can have five-fold, 10-fold, 15-fold, 25-fold, 85-fold, all the numbers that in between that aren't mentioned there. But Jesus is just using this to illustrate that there are those who hear, they understand, they bear fruit, they produce a fruit at the level according to their ability. And, and we need to understand that good ground yields at various levels. Some is a hundredfold, but not all. And if we compare ourselves with the hundredfold person, we're all going to feel like we're failures and we're going to be beating up on ourselves. You know, how come I'm not like that person? How come, you know, that, that person, every, every, seems like every pray, prayer they pray is powerful and people get healed and they're winning people to Jesus and they're discipling and this, it's just like, how come I'm not like, listen, don't get caught in the comparison trap. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that if we compare ourselves among ourselves, we are not wise. It's not wise for me to compare myself to some pastor who's got 25,000 people in his church. That would be a very unwise comparison. That's obviously not what God has called me to do. Believe me, I have enough trouble pastoring 300 and change, whatever it is. I would not be a good candidate for a church of 25,000, but someone is, and thank God they're there. That's wonderful. I don't envy them. (laughs) Okay. Um, Some people are going to be 30-fold, and that's okay. God gave you the capacity, and you will be rewarded for your fruitfulness regardless. Whatever it is that you bring forth as fruit, in your life, because you hear, you understand, and you bear fruit. So let me just end with with a little bit of application as we close this morning. Jesus was all about harvesting. He said a number of things about harvest. If his body, the church, present day, is going to be reconnected to our purpose here on earth, then we have to re-enter the harvest fields that are all around us. In fact, Jesus said, don't say four months and then comes the harvest. I say, lift up your eyes and look around for the fields are already white or already ready, prepared for harvesting. So in other words, don't, don't put it off. <laughs> don't say, well, you know, they're not ready or this is not ready. Look, people are already ready, always ready to reach the good news. If someone would have looked at my life um, when the word of God was shared with me, I think they would have said, oh, he's not ready. You know, he's not open. If someone would have said to me, hey, do you want you know, to hear about the kingdom of God? I don't know what my response would be. 
I just happened to bump into somebody who is a friend who had an experience with Jesus, had an encounter with Jesus. Their life had been changed and, and they just began to share that with me. So it wasn't like I filled out a questionnaire or I went looking for someone to talk to me. People probably would have looked at me and said, oh, don't, don't, don't bother with him. He's never going to listen. Well, I did listen. And the word, God, the word of God went in. And the truth is, I couldn't get it back out. I tried. But it, it was just something that went in. It was like a hook. And, and I, I just, it, it became an irresistible thing within my heart and within my spirit. So it's like we need to understand that sharing the good news um, is important for all of us. It's, it's a responsibility we all carry. And the good news, you know, you're going to find some people in sharing the good news who don't understand, who, who seem to have no root in themselves. They just, or they just never seem to get established. Or others who hear the word of God, but over time things enter in and choke it out. And it would be understandable that you might, you might get discouraged. And yet, stay at it. Because every so often, and I have found this as a pastor, there have been times when I've been deeply discouraged and felt like, you know, nothing is happening here. And, and I don't see, especially I would say the first six years or so, I was just, I, you know, I, I, I fought some deep battles because I was really not seeing the growth and the change and, the under, and things develop the way I thought. But, you know, if you stay at it, uh, every so often, People come along and they represent the good ground. They hear the word of God. They respond. They yield a crop of fruitfulness and growth. And it suddenly all seems worthwhile. You know, a farmer doesn't look out his field and worry about the seed that isn't producing. He's looking forward to harvesting the seed that is producing. And he's excited about it. So I want to give you 10 things really quickly as I end. 10 things really quickly. Number one. Don't stop sowing. Number two, don't stop being a light in the world. Number three, don't abort the mission. Number four, get back to harvest thinking. Number five, pray for people. Number six, be on mission. Number seven, have confidence in the power of God's word. The seed is not the problem. Number seven, ask God how he can use you each day. Number eight, open your mouth. <laughs> and number eight, be bold. Be bold. Be strong. Have faith. Believe. There's harvest out there. There's people in your life, in your circle, in your family, in your workplace, that people that you will encounter that God wants to give you the precious opportunity of being someone who sowed the seed, the word of God into their life and seeing them come to know Jesus. God bless you. Mm -hmm.